Okay, good afternoon, good morning, um, or good evening, wherever you're um, logging in from. Um, so today we are joined by Kevin Eyre um, and Professor Peter Hines. And Kevin today is going to be um, speaking on the topic of shifting the dialogue, um, shift the culture. Um, just before we get on to that, I just wanted to give you a bit of background into the Enterprise Excellence Network um, and, and who we are. So the network was founded by Professor Peter Hines um, and is very much a network for um, lean leaders in Europe. Um, and commonly we have these benchmarking events which are held at um, award-winning host sites in Europe and um, the, the topics are very much driven by the members. Um, but during the, the current um, coronavirus pandemic, we have put these webinars on. So we've had about nine webinars now, um, which are delivered by key um, award-winning speakers, very much to continue to, to give back to the, the Lean community um, and, and to widen the audience as well. Um, just a few um, form, form, formality things with the um, how to use GoToWebinar. So Kevin will deliver a 30 minute presentation and then there'll be a 30 minute uh, dedicated time to ask questions, which you can do using the questions tab, which you'll see um, on your dashboard. And then Peter will deliver those to, to Kevin. Um, okay, so. If you have any more questions after this webinar, please feel free to email myself or Peter, which will be on the follow up email. Um, and you can also visit our website, the enterprise excellence network.com to find out more about the webinars that we have coming up and also the network. OK, so I'll hand over to you, Peter. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Emma, for that. And um, so I'm going to introduce uh, Kevin uh, for you today. And Kevin and I have known each other for I don't know, at least 15 years, maybe a bit longer even than that. Um, and, and we've actually done some work together. And uh, we've had many discussions over those years about um, the sort of human side of, of Lean, where far too many organizations have, have, have penned little attention to the sort of HR, the people side, um, to behaviors. And uh, <clears throat> particularly, uh, Kevin's uh, had a great interest over the years on the language that people use and how they present themselves and how they lead in that respect. So I'm very pleased to um, to invite Kevin to uh, share with us some of his thoughts. He's now uh, Managing Director of uh, Soundwave and uh, he'll tell you more about Soundwave uh, during his session. So uh, over to you, Kevin. Okay, Peter, thank you very much for the introduction and good afternoon, everybody. Um, in fact, yes, Peter, I think it's probably more like 20 years since we've known each other. Um, time flies. Um, so I'm going to take about 30 minutes and uh, just run through an introduction to Soundwave, an introduction with a focus on the language, the talk that people use in leadership roles, particularly in the context of enterprise excellence. Uh, the title, Shift the Dialogue, Shift the Culture, that will become evident to you as a reason for that title as we go through the presentation. Um, I'm gonna talk around these things, uh, an introduction around lean and behavior, a little bit about talk itself, um, what Soundwave is and who Soundwave is, um, something about the results that it's possible to get from Soundwave, and something about the methods that we use to get those results. So here's a really very, very simple model to start with. There are variations on this theme all around uh, the world of continuous improvement, Lean Sigma. Um, I think this model is probably a derivative form from the work of Jeffrey Leica, where there is in this world a focus on the interplay, the relationship between the technical or process way in which organizations operate and the people stuff, the way people interact in a social context. And I think it was Leica who coined the phrase, the socio-technical system, the interplay between people and process. And that to some extent is what we're interested in, but what I'm really interested in is the social, 
what is it on this side of the equation that is so important? And if I had a pound for every time somebody said to me, it's not really the technicalities of lean that matter, it's the people side and getting people to work together well that matter, I wouldn't be having to make the presentation, I'd be lying on a nice hot beach somewhere. Um, the interesting thing is, why is it then when people start to talk about the people dimension or the social in the model I've just been using, they immediately default to talking about behavior. And I think this is my little challenge in this webinar this afternoon, that I'm not sure why we do this. Is it because this is the prevailing paradigm? Is it because the world has been taken over by occupational psychologists? Or is it because um, behavior is just such a broad category, it's easy to talk about? But actually, when we look at behavior and we ask ourselves the question, how much behavior goes on in isolation, i.e. we just are with ourselves, and how much goes on with other people, it's not easy to come to a very simple conclusion. Most of our behavior is involved in social interaction. It's involved in the intimacy of face-to-face -face or faces-to-faces -faces communication. And when that happens, a substantial proportion of what goes on goes on through the medium of talk. In fact, we don't even really often use the word talk. We talk about communication in a very, very abstract and a very generalized way. But perhaps the most important part of what it is to be human, the most important part of what it is to behave, is to have this ability to talk. And that's the position that we at Soundwave take. So let me prove the point. Um, here's, a, here's a, a piece of work in progress. On the left here, you see um, a value that this and many organizations want to have in their operations, trust. If people are to work together, they need to trust each other. And then we break down trust, and we break down trust in this particular case into, into four ways. And I'll pick the first one into open and honest two-way communication. Now, my little chart here just asks a really simple question. Um, if we talk of how much of what we're doing by way of open and honest two-way communication is taken up with doing things versus talking about things. And you'll see very clearly and very simply here that almost none of these um, values or behaviors or competencies or constructs are in any sense possible to do unless we employ the medium of talk. And sometimes the action is the talk. So the how of trust and so many other desired behavioral characteristics is, is substantially in the interaction. It's in the talk of it. And Soundwave's focus is helping people understand how to deliver the actions, the behaviors through talk, through skillful dialogue, skillful communication. So let's talk about the talk. So some, some lovely little pictures taken from some films that some of you may be familiar with. We talk all the time and we talk across many contexts. Sometimes our talk is fast and spontaneous, tense, loud, full of energy. Sometimes it's slow, thoughtful, intense, soft, reflective. It's a capability we broadly take for granted. It's a capability in which we are massively sophisticated. I'm going to open the first very simple poll as we just spend a few minutes thinking about the technicalities of talk. Here's the question. The average person speaks how many words a minute? Okay, so that poll has been launched, Kevin, so we'll just wait for some of the responses to come in. Thank you, Emma. Okay, so just the last few coming in. 
Okay, so far we have 50% voted 125 to 150 words per minute, 25% 75 to 100, and 29% 125 to 175. Okay, that's great. So re relatively even split. I wonder even how many of you, and maybe a number of you, have ever really thought about this question. I mean, I've been talking at you for a few minutes now, um, I don't know how many words I've used. I imagine it's a lot. And although I'm concerned with presenting well to you and I'm prepared and I'm thinking to some degree about what I'm saying, I'm really not thinking about every word. This just strings itself together in a very un unselfconscious flow of words. And, um, oh, forgive me. Here we go. Here's the facts. So actually, those of you who answered A were right, but here are a few more talking facts. Um, the average person speaks at somewhere between 125 and 150 words a minute. That's a lot. Status is more important than gender in who, who talks most. So for those people who come across surveys to say that uh, women tend to speak much more than men, it's not actually very true. 70 to 80 percent of our working time is spent in communications this is my point earlier about the significance of talk of the time we spend in communications nine percent writing 60 percent reading 30 percent percent speaking 45 percent listening interestingly those two things tend to go well together in 600 milliseconds the human brain can think of a word apply the rules of grammar to it and send it to the mouth to be spoken. That's quite an incredible amount of processing. And we listen at 125 to 150 words a minute, but think at 1,000 to 3,000 words a minute. This is the reason why many people complain about not thinking they listen very well or finding that they drift off in the middle of conversation is because our, our brains just work that much faster. We can actually process many, many thoughts than the thoughts that are coming at us. So when someone says to you, if you want to listen well, slow down, this is precisely what they mean, slow the brain down. Human beings are meaning-making mammals. Human beings interact through talk. They generate an understanding, they form relationships, they create social contexts as a consequence of the language that they use. My little timeline here um, points to something that's really important, which is about 70,000 years ago, at about the time when the human brain apparently uh, enlarged itself um, to, twice as si to twice its original size, uh, language as we sort of understand it today is thought to have emerged. But it's a particular type of language that emerges. It's what's called fictive language. Fictive language is the ability not just to talk about the things that are in front of me, but things that are in my imagination. I can talk about the past, I can talk about the future, I can imagine societies and constructs that don't exist, I can communicate these things to people. This is an incredible capability. And congruent with the, the emergence of fictive language is the rapid, rapid accelerating growth in culture and civilization. So talk is social, but context is king. Conversation always takes place within a context. A framework we use very often, a very simple one, is to distinguish between what we call high content contexts and low content contexts. So a high content context is one in which the context is pretty telling me a lot of what I need to do. In an occupational setting, this is the early morning meeting around a tiered board structure, sometimes called a huddle, sometimes with other names. But the process sort of determines the conversation that will be had, and the process lends itself to scripting talk. This is very much front-end organization work. This is the world to some extent of cata coaching and of situational leadership for those of you who are familiar with these types of approaches. The other end, however, is where the context doesn't really tell us 
what we have to do. And this is the realm of skillful dialogue. This is the realm where we only get to an understanding of the problems or the issues that we have to deal with by talking them through. And we can only talk them through well if we're really skillful and we're really listening to what it is that people are saying. So, what is Soundwave? Well, firstly, a little bit about the, int the uh, intellectual tradition in which Soundwave sits. Uh, Soundwave sits inside a tradition that we would refer to as talk is action or talk as action. Um, the primary orientation is sociological rather than psychological, but one could argue there is a social psychology dimension to it. Um, the names of the people and the images of the people in front of you are people who sit within this particular tradition. So John Searle, Elizabeth Stoko, and Alessandro Duranti. There are others that others of you may be familiar with, the sociologist Irving Goffman and the, the work of Luckman and Berger um, and their very, very well known work, The Social Construction of Reality. For those of you who have an academic interest in this, this is a sort of place to go. But what Soundwave is not is a psychometric. What it's not is just psychological in its orientation. It is more sociological. It's concerned with how people are working together at work and in society. Soundwave is essentially a process of learning and institutionalization. So what we aim to do in our work is to take particularly leaders from using talk as something which just happens to being aware or conscious of where their preferences are and where their preferences are not in talk. Secondly, we help people to understand that the way we talk has effects, but it doesn't have random effects. It has reasonably predictable effects. And thirdly, we move people from being reliant on particular habits and mechanisms in the way they talk to being much more fluid. And the significance of that is the world presents many problems and challenges to us in many different forms that requires many different types of verbal responses. The more fluid, the more fluid we are in our verbal responses, the more able we are to meet those particular demands. And for a little bit more of this presentation, I want to just outline some more detail on this. So the, the orientation is supported by, a very busy slide here, an integrated set of products and processes, starting at the bottom with a Brilliance 3 offering, which gives people an initial orientation and insight into what we term your top three voices, working through to organization-wide interventions which deal with systems of social interaction that move um, behavior, interaction and culture towards agreed and desired destinations. And we do that by providing an analytical lens at various levels. So at the highest level we talk about verbal style the difference between people asking, telling, and suggesting, and the impact that those simple three things have on how we feel and how we think. At the next level, we drop down to what we term voices, a breakdown of our clusters of asking, telling, and suggesting into initially nine voices, which in fact extends to another nine overused and another nine underused forms of expression and then finally we get down into analyzing real-time natural conversation and learning from that experience and out of all of this stuff we generate not best guesses but some learnable insights so on the screen in front of you you can see some some assertions some claims we're able to support all of these assertions, all of these claims. So we offer solutions before we invite opinion. I'll pick up just a couple. We offer solutions before we invite opinion. Um, many of you may think this is true. We can confirm that it's true. Leaders, managers in particular, 
because of the way in which they're brought up in organizational life, need to have answers to problems and like to offer those answers as solutions to people. And this in many, many situations is very, very helpful. In some situations, it's distinctly unhelpful because it creates dependency between more senior and less senior people. Um, we're really poor at holding correctional conversations. Now, this is critically important in the lean world, but we have a huge amount of evidence to support the view that the voice of correction, which is one of our nine voices in the sound wave model, is the least preferred voice in the population of people who comprise our sound wave work. And as I said just a second ago, this has really quite profound and I think operational and financial negative consequences for organizations that are trying to sustain processes of continuous improvement. On a slightly more positive note, what our data also tells us is that we can be a bit hard on ourselves. So it's not uncommon for people to walk around and say they don't think they're very good at listening. Actually, our data tells us that people are actually much better at listening than they think they are. We can take confidence from that. So who is Soundwave? Well, Soundwave is people like you. Soundwave data uh, settles principally around private sector organizations, executives and leadership teams, senior and middle managers, in organizations that typically have an agenda for improvement, and the data set for our assessment tools is predominantly North America and Europe, but not exclusively so. But 100 organizations, about 6,000 sets of data, verifiable norms and independently validated statistics. The sorts of results we get from using Soundwave when this is deployed through our skillful dialogue programs are these sorts of things. Leaders achieving external recognition. We have a number of cases of people being awarded at that national level, um, awards for best lean leader, or best managing director of a business in a geography as a consequence of the work they've done in lean, supported and enabled by Soundwave. Uh, improvements to KPIs, hugely increased ownership. As an outcome in organizations, many organizations are looking to make sure that people, that leaders generate ownership for activity and improvement amongst their people, and Soundwave goes for that big time. So how do we get those results? Two main things, a process of learning and a process of institutionalization. So I wanna take a few minutes just to talk about um, each of those in turn. So back to the earlier slide when I talked about there being a shift from us not being terribly aware of the way we talk to being really aware of the way we talk. So we use our framework, ask, tell, suggest with our nine voices. We invite people to undertake personal assessments, brilliance three, self-perception 360 and some others. Um, we do some really great work around reverse coaching. So we build the capability of people to interact at a higher level by having them coach members of the teaching team, as it were, and um, to be provided with real-time feedback on how they're coping. And we also spend time uh, recording, audio recording, deliberately not filming, we're not interested in the visual data so much, but audio recording, um, real-time conversations between people and the people that work for them, and then sitting down subsequently and analyzing that and asking some critical questions. Uh, what voices did you hear? What was the impact on the other person? What was the impact on you from the impact on the other person? What needs to change to shift the quality of this relationship? Which brings me to the second poll. So I've mentioned this simple um, distinction between these three verbal styles of asking, telling and suggesting and interested to know what it is you think you might do, Emma. Okay, so the second poll is just being launched. If, you're, if you can please uh, select your answers.
Okay, so 70% voted ask, 40% said suggest, and 10% tell. Can I, can I just check those percentages, Emma? Yeah, I think probably what's happened is um, there's either been double selections or um, I think that's why it's slightly thrown off. So <laughs> that's, that's, I'm just making sure I haven't misheard. My maths isn't really that great. Uh, uh, so well, let's go with the top. So most most of you think you ask. So if you do, that's amazing. Uh, it's not typical of what the data says. What the data suggests is that. Uh, most leaders are hovering somewhere around the suggest space with a little bit of a nudge towards tell. Uh, not so many are strongly at the tell end. Uh, a reasonable proportion think they're at the ask end, but there's a little bit of a difference here between what people think they're doing and then in practice what people are really doing. And although people self-report asking at a reasonably high level, empirically I'm afraid and clearly not the case of participants today, it doesn't quite stack up. There's much less asking going on than people think there is. So our assessments use data. I'm not going to go through the detail of this, but you know, grasps, we're cool about that. And the data drives decisions. So here's a real example, an organization which wants to uh, deliver a culture of operational excellence. Um, its management level information says they're doing a fair amount of challenge, but what they're not doing, coming back to a, a comment I was making earlier, is they're not correcting. Um, and so what they need is greater compliance, more psychological safety. They need to increase the voice of correction in the organization. They need to reduce the voice of challenge, which brings some degree of threat and volatility. And then they need to understand the effects. What is the predictable effect of one voice over any other? In the little picture on the left that you can see here, this is actually picking up the uh, the targeted talk from the voice of to advocate, which is to persuade and argue. Um, this drives a, a level of alertness and connection. The overuse of it, which is to preach, drives tension and a sense of being overwhelmed. And then finally, in this section, fluency. Um, demands come at managers and leaders across a whole range of possibilities from organizational crisis at the left of this model to personal crisis at the right. Each of those situations calls for a different role and seeks a different outcome. Our data tells us that some people have a preference for being in one place rather than all places. And we're building capability to run up and down the, the length of this model. Process of institutionalization. So at one end, um, where we come to the, the daily huddle, the systematic use and run through of KPIs against key issues of the day, there's and a focus on conformance, it's possible to script dialogue. Um, we have a client at the moment who refers to this system as their system of acoustic management to complement their system of visual management. At the other end of the spectrum, we just need deep skill. We need leaders who spontaneously can hear what is going on and can drive dialogue in creative and constructive ways. And that means that there are particular questions that they need to answer and actions that need to be taken. What is the cultural destination? What dialogue will create this culture? It's not just the fact that people bump into each other every day and say hi. It's the detailed, complex sophistication of the conversation they're having, day in, day out, drip, 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 that drives and shapes the culture. And there are particular actions and developmental actions that they learn to take to build that capability. And the other key point here is that people follow where congruence prevails. So there really isn't any point in having a well orientated um, daily huddle if at the other end of the spectrum or the other end of the hierarchy, we've got people who are spending all day long arguing with each other and not practicing what they're preaching should be done at the front line. And I know that's a common thing to say, um, but it's usually said with respect to behavior. We need the same behavior at the top end as we need at the bottom end. Actually, what we need is the same talk 
In fact, we need better, more sophisticated talk at the senior end in order that we get congruence at the front end. So Soundwave gives priority to talk. What people say and how they say it matters to those around them. We take cues and focus our energy on a minute to minute basis. This is our contention, not so much from the measures that sit behind our performance as from the conversations that make up our day. Talk is action, own your conversation. I'm going to stop there, Peter and Emma. Thank you for listening. Great, thank you very much, uh, Kevin. Um, as ever, some some great stuff in there. Um, what we're going to do now is open the questions. Um, so, uh, if any of you would like to ask some questions now, uh, Kevin will be able to um, to answer that. Um, so, what we'll do is, if you type your question in, I'll read them out, and Kevin can give a a response. Um, Perhaps, perhaps while you're uh, thinking or, or typing, I'll ask one for Kevin or a, a comment. Um, it was interesting to see the poll there. Um, and I know when you've actually done, you know, the, that actually we have a lot of inquirers uh, in, in, you know, askers in the, uh, in the audience here. Now that could be, we have a very biased sample here, or it could be, could be um, certainly what I've seen is a lot of people think they're asking um, mm. in style, but actually they're really telling. Would you like to sort of comment on that? Yeah, I, and, I, and I think in, in a way you, you sort of hit upon it. What we notice and what the data reveals is that people think they're inquiring. So we've got three asking voices in, in the Soundwave model, inquiring, probing and diagnosing. Most of us don't spend too much time thinking about the differences between those things. I spend quite a lot of bit of time thinking about the differences. Leaders think they inquire. Actually, they do ask, but what they tend to do is they tend to use the diagnostic form. And so they, they arrive in the world with leading questions. They ask a question that has an answer in it because part of the orientation is try to gently persuade other people to embrace a course of action that the leader thinks might be appropriate. And, and our experience of building skill with people is that some, but not all leaders, find it really quite difficult to shift away from providing the implicit answer in the question to asking what are really genuine open questions. And the distinction is important because it's the genuine open question which will get people to think for themselves. The leading question will not get people to think for themselves. It'll get them to think about the extent to which they should agree with the boss's implicit suggestion. So mm. I think our data and your perception are pretty aligned, Peter. Mm. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, we've you. got a first question coming in from Steve here. Um, Steve says, uh, where does the language to get offers and requests to get a commitment to act in a cooperative way, I guess, come from? So read that one out again. Uh, where does the language to get offers and requests to get a commitment to act in a cooperative way come from? So if I focus on that, how do we get people to operate? Let me go there. How do we get people to operate in a cooperative way? I don't think there's a, a straightforward answer to that question. I think there will be multiple ways of doing it. Um, we might get people to cooperate through persuasion. So if I'm really skilled at advocacy, I might be winning people over to my cause. I might get people to cooperate when I'm really listening and really inquiring. So the combination of some really good listening with some really good questions gets people to feel like I'm genuinely interested in what they have to say Furthermore, I articulate what it is I've heard. So I play back what I've heard. And so the perception is I'm really listening, I've really heard. And that combination of articulation, inquiry, and listening is what's likely to pull people in to wanting to cooperate. There's certainly a bit of research we've done which looks at how we get cooperation using the sound wave voices and the two voices that are critical to that are the voices of inquiry and the voice of articulation 
art to articulate is simply to explain, to narrate. Mm. And the iteration between those two things combined with listening will drive levels of cooperation. But cooperation also, if I may say, um, exists across you know, a multitude of forms and a multitude of contexts. So I don't want to appear too glib in my response. No, okay. Um, so, point from Tim, which I think links to that to some degree as well, is uh, his point is um, asking questions is the thing to do. I've experienced that opening up and sharing some vulnerable personal information or experiences helps to uh, helps that to sort of happen. Um, what would be your views on this? Uh, well, my views, Tim, are that you're doing exactly the right thing. Um, the the label I'd give that would be disclosure. Um, if I if I disclose something about myself, typically what that does, it allows um, somebody else to relax a little. You know, so this person's revealing something about themselves. And to use the jargon, which is around a lot today, um, we're sort of making ourselves a little more vulnerable. So the other person can relax and make themselves a little more vulnerable. Now, disclosure is critical because the more people disclose about themselves and each other, the more opportunity there is to ask more questions. The more questions we ask, the more interest we take in people, the greater the disclosure. And so we get this amazingly virtuous cycle starting to generate itself. And you know, in an ideal world, all conversations with all people are completely open and everything is possible to explore. Now, this is a theoretical possibility, but it's not one in practice that ever really happens. We all hold a lot of stuff very close to ourselves. At work, where we're driving for cultures that, that encompass things like trust, trying to move to a point where we can get more disclosure is a really important thing to do. It will drive the openness and it will fuel the trust that we're looking for. So if that's what you're doing, Tim, um, I don't know who you are, but keep doing it. Disclosure will generate trust. Okay, sounds good. So uh, just while we're waiting for some more points to come in, uh, Tim says thank you for the feedback on that one. Um, one of the experiences that I was particularly impressed with, um, and uh, a few months ago I wrote a chapter for an upcoming book, uh, which was around a company in the west of Ireland known to you well, um, where the operations director talked, to, talked about voice bingo. Do you want to give us a bit of a big background on voice bingo? Um, I think voice bingo. So this is a it's a little um, it's a little game essentially that we play to tune people into to listening clearly. So if you are if certainly yeah, Peter's just been speaking and um, he's just he's just outlined a situation. Now, if if I were to ask a question, what has Peter said, you might summarize what he said, which would be a perfectly good thing to do. But if I were to apply an analytical frame to what he's done, and Soundwave is an analytical frame, say, what was the voice you heard? Then we would give that a name. In this case, it would be the voice of to articulate, because this is a, a res relatively simple description, explanation of a set of facts or a set of circumstances. Now, once we tune in and hear those things, it gives us a sense of what the person is trying to do. And it also puts us in control of the conversation and helps us move the conversation somewhere else. Now, we're really unaccustomed to, to looking at talk analytically. So the bingo is somebody talks, somebody says something, name that voice, name, name what is going on here. So we're listening at a much more deep level than conventionally we do. One of the really interesting things about this is, you know, we we have nine constructs of voices, we'll listen to them, we can name them, we can play with them. But let's be clear, these are not the only nine ways of using our voice. Uh, and so it generates really interesting and deeper discussions about what's going on in the dialogue. Why is it I feel really good here? Because of what he said to me. Why am I feeling really bad? Because of what he said to me. We can get underneath the skin of this and then we can talk about the talk. Let's talk about not the relationship per se, but the, the part of the relationship which is delivered through talking communication. Mm -hmm. And this is important because I can change it. I don't have to change my behavior particularly. I certainly don't have to change my personality. I change the way my talk to change the relationship. Mm. Okay, very good. Um, so it's a question from Steve, which 
sort of spurs something in my mind is um, obviously when we talk about communication, verbal communication is is one form of communication. Um, I don't know, staring at people is another, body language is another, and so forth. So, um, so Steve's asking, where does body language uh, and mood uh, fit in with 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 this sort of uh, language as well? Yeah, so it's it remains important, uh, and I think the position that we've taken with Soundwave is is not that these things are unimportant, but that they've been given too much importance. That it's not possible to run this um, webinar without me talking. I mean, I can be pulling all sorts of facial expressions and gestures, and you can guess what they are, but you'll get most of them wrong. Actually, what tends to happen is a talk and gesture work together. And when they come together, they impart very, very powerful communications. But we need to take the whole thing. And, and our view is that actually we're not very good, very often, at picking up the true meaning of gestures. The gestures are open to quite wide interpretation, but talk is a precision instrument. With talk, we can be really clear and really specific about what we mean. We can, of course, lie, and there's quite a bit of that that goes on. But actually, human beings are quite good at detecting lying, and they detect lying through things like the tone of voice and also the gestures that go with it. So what is important to do is to deal with all of these things. But we're giving an accent to talk because there's real richness in being able to understand uh, what someone's saying, how they're saying it and what it might mean in and of its own right. And, and actually, you know, the work we do is very often why we just use audio. We want to screen out some of the visual because the visual will come back in. It's inevitable. The visual will come back in. But we want to screen it out so that people start to really tune in, listen much, much better and communicate much, much better verbally. Mm. Okay. okay, so I, I was interested in, in one of your former slides. Um, if I translate that into some sort of lean speak, you were saying that in some some situations, the dialogue is quite scripted so for instance mm. a board meeting or something like that whereas some cases where you're walking down a corridor and you bump into someone for example it's it's a less scripted so would that be true to say that on the right hand side is more the sort of leader standard work stuff the sort of regimented things like the gemba walk the one-to-one -one coaching session etc cetera, etc cetera, which are quite well scripted and and, and 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 hence the style and the language is is quite well known this is more the informal and and obviously as you go up the organization the higher percentage of time is informal rather than you know at the shop floor it's quite standard in terms of what you do most of the time etc so so i think that's exactly right peter and i think this is one of the i mean i think uh for good reason a lot of the a lot of lean work focuses on the front end of the operation. There's a very good reason for that. And then we start to deal with, you know, behavior and interaction at the front end. And because work is uh, a bit more structured and repetitive, it becomes possible to get fast control over that. And conversations tend to be around things which reasonably commonly occur. You know, this machine part has failed. Let's talk about what we do in that circumstance. We know that machine parts will fail mm. quite often, um, maybe. We, we know that people won't always follow standard work and that the inability to follow standard work will occur quite often. So, so let's not allow individuals to make up the conversation every time they have it. Let's put something in place that's based on what's the best way to handle this situation. And people can learn that and becomes repetitive, it becomes scripted. It still needs to be delivered with skill, otherwise people hear the script and they lose the humanity and then people don't like it. But the further up the organization we go and the more strategic the role, the far less that is true. The far, far less is true. We might use models, techniques, methods to give structure to what we're doing, but fundamentally, unless we can really talk the thing through in ways that are unplanned and unscripted and rely deeply on our ability to make meaning and communicate we won't deal with the issue you know? yeah so, uh, I'm, I'm sort of thinking of this as um 
you know, pyramids and inverted pyramids and, and this sort of thing. And, and right. I'm thinking of some of the sessions I run on leader standard work, etc. And so if you yeah. think about what is standardized at the front line, the, the, the day job, the operator, you know, the frontline worker, wherever they are, it's, it's probably about 80 percent of their time is standardized. And it's Correct. probably 50 percent at the frontline manager. 30%, 20% as you get up to the sort of top management. So if you reverse that figure, so hence it's 70, 80% of the time is this important talk focus at the top going down to 50% and maybe 20% of the frontline worker. That, that's that's exactly right. And and what, what we find is that with with some of the tools and methods in the marketplace that help leaders with their interaction, the more senior the personnel, the less they find those um, more structured methods, simple methods, helpful. Because the more senior end of the world is just that much more complex. You need more nuanced tools to be able to deal with it. And um, in the same way, work will come right way down from senior level to frontline level. I think where Soundwave has its most impact is at the senior and middle levels in organisations. Sure. So if you were starting with an organization, would you, you typically start with the senior management team? Yeah, absolutely. I would, I'll would. i go so far as to say I see no point starting at the front end. What happens at the top sets the tone. We, we you know, that's been voiced many times before in many different ways. Um, and so what's really important is we have leaders who understand what is the tone that they're setting. Literally, what is the tone of their setting? What are the voices that are cascading down the organization? What impact is that having on the people below? Mm. And so once the leadership team have got their head around this, <clears throat> then it becomes possible for them to interact broadly at the next level mm. in a way that is much more constructive. And there's a building process that goes on over a period of time. And we get down to the front end, and actually the front end, we might be talking to people about the difference between um, telling, asking, and suggesting, and not really very much more, because just that differentiation helps people to tune in. That's a bit of glue around the uh, the standard work, in fact. Mm. I, I'm, I'm thinking uh, another, we, we're not getting so many questions, so I'm just going to keep going for a bit. So uh, okay. hopefully people are finding these questions interesting. So. One, one thought I had is, are you are you seeing any differences between different industries? Because, you know, we think of things like automotive and construction as maybe steel industry as quite hard headed, brutal industries, whereas perhaps some of the service industries, are, you know, not, not quite so sort of tough man, alpha male sort of orientated. Are you, are you seeing any of those differences? We certainly see quite a lot of differences between leadership teams. Um, we haven't done any industry by industry analysis, so I couldn't give you a you know, factually clear statement to say the health industry is like this and yeah. the steel manufacturing is like this. <clears throat> but one can probably think about some differences. One of the, um, I think one of the big differences we notice is about the level of assertion in teams. So voices of the type of, critique or challenge or correct tend to be a little more dominant where there are real things that have to happen. We're making real stuff. And some of the what we call the less socially risky voices are more dominant in some of the more service orientated industries. But I don't want to generalize too much because I think actually the, the, the really interesting point is how leadership teams differ so radically from each other, irrespective of what industry they happen to be in. Sure, sure. Mm. I suppose on a, a similar sort of thought to that was was the sort of um, cultural uh, perspective, because obviously you're sitting there in, in the UK there and some of our audience are in, I don't know, US or India or, you know, other European countries, etc. So, you're sort of suggesting that there's a degree to which you might situationally use different voices and, and, and so forth, I think, um, but a more preference towards asking. Do you think that might vary by a sort of culture? You you, you know, would that be the same in India as it in, in the US or France or, or something like that? Yeah, we've done a little bit of work around cultural differences. There, there are some. Again, I don't want to make too strong a claim because you know, the idiosyncrasies are wide. 
Um, but I can give you a few examples. Um, the, let's take the correctional voice. So one of the nine core voices to correct, which is to maintain boundaries, to point out the limitations in something. Um, the overall data says, says that this is the least preferred voice. Um, right. Nobody across any culture can test the relevance of the voice. That's probably an important thing. So whether it's in India, Ireland, China, or um, Slovakia, uh, the nine voices which constitute the Soundwave model, people say, yeah, this, this sort of makes sense. The correctional voice is lowest overall um, and has been the lowest since we first developed Soundwave. But in some cultures, it's a little higher. So the, we have a reasonable amount of Chinese data. In the Chinese data, it's about mid-ranking. So there's something in that culture that says we, we tend to um, point out the failings or the limitations or the, the lack of meeting expectations with a greater proclivity than Western cultures do. Okay. Mm. Um, similarly, in um, in Slovakia, actually, it is Slovakia, in Slovakia, um, did a little bit of work in Slovakia, the correctional voice, the data sample is relatively small, maybe 30 or 40 people, um, it's the most preferred voice. Um, right. okay. Slovakia as a culture tends to correlate with the Hof Hofstede culture work as being one of the most authoritarian cultures in Europe, or at least it was. Some time ago, yeah, I, I was sort of thinking of some of the Hofstede and some of the sort of East European, the post-communist yeah. culture um, has has tended to be a little bit more dictatorial, right. perhaps. And so and although it's the lowest voice overall, there are some cultures, the Irish culture, for instance, where it's even lower. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So there's there's a much yeah this this culture values other things. Now I think the position we take is this matters but what matters more is the ability to use all styles of interaction all voices whenever you need to irrespective right. of culture and irrespective of personal preference and that would sort of link to the situational leadership uh, thing that you alluded to a little bit earlier that uh, change of voice with the situation that you're uh, you're encountering yeah, exactly right so diff different roles in particular requiring different things. So if you take a, a workplace counsellor, it's going to sound very different from a workplace commander-in-chief. The sure. reality, however, is that the same person might need to occupy both of those roles in the course of a working week. So yeah. you need the flexibility to be able to play them well. And you yeah. can do that through learning what the voices sure. are. Sure. So a couple of questions sort of linked to, uh, with that slightly. Um, the first is from uh, my friend Jacko, who's a Dutch guy living in the UK. So and his, wow. his question is, how, how does this work outside of the English language? So if you were doing this in Dutch or French, I mean, is there a, a, a is it in other languages and does it work in the same way? Uh, so, so two answers to this question. The first is that the constructs themselves the, the, the nine voices, and then, as I mentioned very briefly, there's nine overuse or accentuated voices and none underuse or passive voices. We get very complex 27 voices if we want to. Um, nobody, nobody I have ever come across in any culture has contested the validity of the constructs. All cultures inquire, all cultures correct, all cultures advocate, all cultures critique. Might have a different word for it. So that's the first thing. Nobody can test that. There are there are some differences I was alluding to in your previous question, Peter. In in terms of language, um, English, Chinese, Spanish are the three dominant languages that we use in Soundwave. So we have uh, material to use in those languages. Um, we have done some translation into French and German and Dutch. Okay. Um, and there doesn't seem to be a major problem in translating the concepts and getting them understood. Okay. Okay. So that's sort of where we are in terms of language capability. Yeah. Okay. I've done quite a lot of work in the Netherlands actually 
with um, Soundwave and we have some people who are accredited practitioners in Soundwave who are Dutch. Okay, very good. So uh, it's probably more a point than a question actually from Mark. Um, so he's saying in his experience in India and China, the more senior the manager, the less they ask of their peers and lower ranks as it's seen as a failure on their, uh, their part. Just give me that question again, or that statement again. So what he's saying is that um, in, in his experience in India and China, the more senior the manager, the less they ask of their peers and lower ranks as it's seen as a failure. Yeah. So, so I, 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 well, I, I, will, I will bow to Mark's uh, uh, more dominant experience than me. I have a moderate amount of experience in China and I worked for a company for a while which was owned by a Chinese company. And so I'm, I'm familiar with this hierarchical um, effect, which can be quite pronounced. Um, now, I haven't done any study on what quite the effects would be, other than a generalization, which I, I suppose is a point of belief or value, which is that asking is really important. Actually, not asking and leads to not knowing, and not knowing leads to poor decisions. I think the, these, cultural, um, these cultural factors that disrupt, in a way, the natural flow of conversation are to be thought about very seriously. I mean, in our data, which is substantially Western Europe, North America, we still take a view driven by the research findings that hierarchy skews conversations. It distorts the natural process of conversation. And, and we see that because in our 360 data, um, when people have independence report on how they hear somebody talk they offer almost always a more enlightened perspective there's much more asking to keep it simple for the moment there's much more asking than that than when it comes to a boss subordinate relationship in either mm -hmm. direction mm -hmm. so the more hierarchy the more skewed the natural flow of conversation and what i think mark you might be suggesting here is there's another cultural factor that comes in that might skew that even more now, my personal view would be that's possibly not a good thing, but I don't want to make too much of a judgment about it. Okay. Sure. So I think you're on to something. Good, good. Well, time's against us, uh, Kevin. Um, so I think we probably need to wrap things up there. So thank you very much for uh, presenting, sharing your insights. And, and as ever, I've learned something from the presentation and how I, this yeah. fits in with leader standard work. So that's, uh, that's great for me. Um, so I think, Emma, you're just going to uh, close us down for the day. Yes, thank you very much, Kevin. That was really, really interesting. Um, some really, really good uh, food for thought there. Um, so thank you, everyone, for connecting. Um, it's great to see so many of you and some familiar names as well. Um, if you wouldn't mind at the end, there's some feedback uh, questions. And as I mentioned previously, for future webinars, please visit our website, which again will be on the follow up email. Um, and any further questions, please don't hesitate to email myself or Peter. Um, so yes, thank you very much. I'll just leave you with a quick um, poll just to rate the webinar um, and then we'll close down Kevin and Peter. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Okay, so if you could please just um, rate this webinar for us. Okay. Thank you very much. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you. Okay. Goodbye. Thanks, Kev. Goodbye. Goodbye. Bye. Do we stay on the floor now?